I'm so excited about what God is doing in this body. Um, really, you know, in churches across Canada, today is the least attended church Sunday of the whole calendar year, right? So, so I was so excited this morning when, when I came in, and just in our prayer time before the time, I saw people excited to be here. Um, I was also excited when I got up this morning and I saw it was raining, um, <laughs> Because then I knew people's su- last day, Sunday, hot summer day was canceled. So <laughs> all things work out for those who trust in God, right? So um, no, it's, I'm so happy to see that people like, I love, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, and even when I didn't like going to church, I didn't have an excitement about being there. But God has built a passion and an excitement into our body, which is, it's contagious. Like you can see people being excited to be here. And even if they're faking it, they're doing it really well. <laughs> it's because I can see it on their faces. It's, they don't walk in and go, oh, church. It's like they, there's love and there's family and there's fellowship. So I'm so thankful for, for you guys. I'm, um, I really believe God is doing something. And, and when September comes and this new year starts, I really believe that we're going to see a greater outpour of souls being saved for Christ than we've seen before. And it's because we're carrying the heart of God. That's really, if we carry the heart of God into people's lives, God's heart is beautiful. It is beautiful. Um, God's heart is, is loving and kind and accepting, and people want it. Um, and that's, what, uh, that's our identity. That's what we want for us as a body. So, so we are in a series, um, uh, and the series can be said one or two ways. It depends on where you are in your life. The title is, God, you want me to do what? Um, and it's kind of the, the first what is, are you being ridiculous? You want me to do that? You want me to do what? Or it can be the, the desire of, of somebody. Um, and if you're the first one, don't feel judged. And we all, we, all of us have been there. Um, you want me to do what? This is never going to work. That will never work. You want me to love my enemies? Are you crazy? Right? You cray cray. That's not going to work, God. I, I have to do to them what they do to me. I can't just forgive my family member. I can't just be kind and generous to people. I can't bring an offering to church and expect something to happen because I've done that. I can't just surrender my life, all my dreams. All. You want me to do what? No, that's not going to work, God. And, and as we grow in our relationship, we actually start to realize that we can trust Him. And even those things that seem ridiculous in our culture, when we do things His way, our lives change for the better, not for the worse. And the second way you can, can be is as you've grown and as we've grown in our relationship with God would, is the following. God, you want me to do what? Like I've got a desire to now not only follow your principles... In your word, which is fantastic, but I also have a desire to follow your plans and purposes for my life. I want to do what you've called me to, to do. I want to be what you've called me to do. So, so in week one, uh, we focus on being plugged into God. If he, you can only bring forth the power of the thing that you've been plugged into. If you're plugged into nothing, you can only achieve in your own abilities. But when we're plugged into God and have, have that source of love and strength and hope and life that, feed, that we feed from Him, we are able to give it to other people. Our mindset has to be, it's not just about me. Please remember that. You are not in relationship with God just for you. That's where it starts, but that is only the start. That is the start of the race. You and God. God, now I'm connected with you. Good. Now your life starts. Because your life starts with the purpose to influence other people's lives. Now, um, this week, uh, you want me to do what? And it's kind of like that wedding message, until death do us part. Right, that, that's kind of the, the subline that I have for you is until death do us part. God, you want me to do until death do us part. So what you're saying is that we're going to be together until the day we die. Is, is that what you're asking of me? Yes, I want to be with you until the day you die. Okay, so if you want me to be together until the day we die, we know that, that there has to be something that you want me to do then. And because in any relationships, there are certain roles that each one of us play. So... Uh, This week's main theme is my committed calling. Something that I am committed to in a calling. Now, each and every single one of you are called into ministry. 
I don't know if you know that, but every single one of you are. Before I step into that, I want you to do something with me. Now, uh, everybody, please participate. I want you to look around. Look around in this room. Okay, if you're single, look around. If you see somebody else who's single, <laughs> right? If they're single, give them one of these. <laughs> if, if you are single, do one of these back. If you're not, don't do one of these back. Okay, look around, still look around. I want you to look around. Now, while you're looking around, I want you to picture the people that you're looking at. And what I want you to imagine is, imagine their family. Cousins, aunts, nieces, nephews, brothers, mothers, sisters, daughters, whatever. They, imagine their family members. Okay, now I want you to imagine all their friends. Friends, imagine every friend that they've got. Every friend that they had since elementary school up to now. Uh, hopefully, uh, by, by friend, I mean more than one. Um, friends, all their friends. Now, imagine all their co-workers. I want you to imagine the people that they work with. Uh, now, imagine the people that they just crossed in the street. Now, uh, we have approximately 150 people in this congregation this morning. Now, according to vital statistics and to surveys that has been done by the Bema Group, they say that the average person knows... 600 people, average person, that's an average person. Now, I know some of you might be a little bit quieter, so you don't necessarily have to reach. Some of us are a little bit more louder, so we know more people. Uh, depends on what line of work you're in. You can go up to about 1,500, and you can go up to even 2,500. Depends on how good your memory is. Um, but no, the average person knows, let's say, 600. If we take 150 people that knows 600 people, that means today we know 90,000 people in this room. We know 90,000 people, which is amazing. Now, the average person meets 27,027 people in their lifespan. The average person. 27,000 people and 27. So if we take just this room and we say there's 150 people in this room and we times it with 27,000 and 27, that means in this room we have become acquainted with 4.5 million people. Just this room, which is amazing. Now, yeah, this is something which they also surveyed, uh, and this is very important to understand. I want you to know, I cannot save all those people. I cannot influence the 90,000 people that's known in this room. I cannot get them to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. I cannot do it. But we can. We have the ability, just with the people that we know, to influence 90,000 people. 90,000. Now, if we just take Canada, for example, right? Canada, 37.5 30, million people currently, what they're saying, according to their stats, that's in the country. 37.5 million. Out of the 37.5 million, if you go to the average person on the street, 72% of them would say they are Christian, okay? Out of the 72% that say they are Christian, only 4% attends church once a month. So that breaks it down to just under 2 million people in the whole of Canada. Out of that 2 million people, can you imagine if we add a 90,000 to that and they start doing the same in other people's lives, how we can influence this nation? Because there's not a whole lot of people. It's not like we're trying to change 3.5 billion people. We are trying to influence the people in our lives. But if we don't get hungry to make a change in people's lives, if we only think it's the church's job, people, the church is empty because people think it's the church's job to get people to church. It's the church's job to save people. It's a, we were over Europe and the churches were beautiful buildings with no beautiful people in them. They were all outside. Because for too long we have said it is the pastor's responsibility. It is the preacher's the evangelist. It is No, you are called to ministry. Every single one of you are called to ministry. 
Now, here's a very interesting thing. Not every one of you are called to full-time ministry. I know it's not interesting. It's good because otherwise um, we need a whole lot more to be able to pay for everybody to do this full-time. But did you know that the most people in the Bible that you are acquainted with, that you know of, that you know really well, weren't in full-time ministry? Do you know that most of them were doing the work that you're doing today? If we look at Abraham, in Abraham it says the following, um, Genesis 13 verse 2. Abraham was very rich in livestock, silver and gold. So we know for sure he wasn't a preacher. <laughs> That's a fact. He was not in full-time ministry. Um, the next one, Isaac, Genesis 26, 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Isaac was a farmer. Good, farmer. Lived in Lander. Amos. <laughs> Amos 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders. Amos was a sheep breeder. David. David was a shepherd. He worked for a sheep breeder. Gideon was thrashing wheat. Nehemiah um, 1 verse 11, I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah was a bartender. <laughs> he was. He poured wine. That's what he did. He was a, bar, he was a waiter. Matthew. Matthew worked for Revenue Services Canada. <laughs> And that alone should prove to you that God can use anybody. <laughs> right? Andrew and Peter, what did they do? They were fishermen. Fishermen. But something interesting, they were also businessmen. If you read Mark 1 verse 20, And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with hired servants. They were businessmen, not just fishermen, businessmen. Paul, so, uh, and this is Paul, Acts 18 verse 1, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation, they were tent makers, they were developers, real estate agents, <laughs> right, builders, because people lived in tents, Luke, Colossians 4, 14, Luke, the beloved physician, he was a doctor, God is not against doctors. Don't let anybody ever make you feel guilty for going to a doctor. If you are a doctor, start showing God's love for people who's coming to you. Okay? Rahab, she was a working girl. <laughs> yeah, she was into tourism. Um, <laughs> so, something very interesting Bish told me when they ministered in Madagascar there's a certain way you call people so in Madagascar Bish was busy leading worship if you do this you're calling a prostitute so if you want to call people you have to do it this way so their culture has a different meaning so Bish is busy playing worship <laughs> and he's wanting to call the other people they could <laughs> come and the whole congregation went <gasps> He's calling the tourism expert on stage. Um, but very interesting about Rahab, she was also a shopkeeper and an innkeeper because that's the main reason why the spy stayed with her. She was into tourism. She was into the hotel industry, into food, and into selling stuff. So what we've covered is we've covered shepherds, we've covered businessmen, we've covered fishermen, we've covered farmers, we've covered um, working for the government, we've covered working for, for um, um, the medical system, doctors, we've covered tourism, hotel industry, um, we've covered people that were just regular people. Jesus was what? A framer. Carpenter. Worked with wood. So, so don't think because you are in a certain industry that you are removed from ministering on God's behalf. Every single one of us are called into ministry. So we have to be ready for it. So how do we find out what your calling is? 
and what your ministry is. How do we find that out? Number one, and it's going to sound familiar. Number one, draw near to God. That's the only way you will find out what God's calling is on your life is when you draw near to the one that's created you for what he's created you for. Asaph, he wrote quite a few uh, of the Psalms. Asaph, in Psalm 73, 28 says the following. It is good for me to draw near to God. It's good for me to draw near to God. Now, now I know there's some of you that might feel this way. What if I don't feel like it? Or what if I had a really bad day? Or what if I had a really bad week? Or what if, what if I've had a really bad life or a really bad year or a bad night? What if I, I don't feel like doing it? I want you to hear me. When you draw near to God, your life changes. I know we don't always feel, feel like doing it. But that is where we step out in faith. And we start applying principles from God's word. And as I draw near to him, your life changes. If you're being depressed or sad or broken or just don't feel like, man, I just don't have the energy. I want to encourage you to do the one thing that will change your life more than comments, more than encouraging words from people. It is you drawing near to God. You making that decision that you are going to stand up out of this hole, the sadness, whatever you are going through, you deciding that you are going to draw near to Him. That will change your life. In Hebrews 7, 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The law makes nothing perfect. It's not about what you look like. It is you drawing near to God. We don't draw near because we're good. We draw near because of His grace. In Hebrews 10 verse 22, it says the following, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You're not drawing near to God because you feel clean. You're not drawing near to God because you feel right. Um, this is a picture of me um, um, just working at the house with trying to get stuff clean. Um, as you can see, my legs, my, now what I love to do, and I'm sure most of the men love to do this. After you've worked in the garden and you've, you've gone with the weed eater, the weed whacker, or you've, you've you know, sprayed stuff and you're dirty. You know what I like doing more than anything is when I walk into the house? Is say to Ermery, give me a hug. I do. I love it. And then I try to find the kids, and I try to hug them also. Because you're dirty, right? They don't want to get close to you. What do they tell you? Go wash yourself. Clean up, right? And then saying that just makes me want to hug them more. But, but we have to understand, even if you're covered in dirt, God doesn't care. He's not influenced by your dirt. His arms are open. He's not influenced by your rights or your wrong choices. His arms are wide open. He doesn't tell you, go and clean yourself up first. No, he's actually the one saying, I'm going to wipe you down. Because of my blood, you are clean. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be spotless. He's made you spotless. So next question, what if you are in a bondage or under a stronghold? Can I draw near to God if I'm in bondage or stronghold? Something that I'm addicted to, something that I'm struggling with, something that I'm, I just can't beat. You can. The demon-possessed man in the Bible was bound by Satan. Listen, you can be bound. doesn't matter what it is. Run to God. And as believers, let us not be the ones that have CP... I'm not, we're not looking to have people free from everything. Only if you're free from everything can you worship in the church. No. This is the place where people come because they have the heart's desire to get their lives lined up with God wants it. This is not the place where perfect people are. Amen. This is not. We are not perfect. Nobody in this room. We all have things that we struggle with. Now, some people have addictions. I believe even if you are an addict, even if you shut up this morning, if you come here, I believe God has the ability and, the, and the, the power and the love to embrace you and to get you free from it. doesn't matter if you fall tomorrow again. Just keep on coming back to Him. It is His goodness that changes people's lives. It is His kindness that changes people's lives. It is Him that do it. We cannot guilt people into getting free from their addictions. It's God who does it. It's His work. And not by guilt. It's by love. 
What about if you're going through a hard time or a sad time or even a mad time where God um, had the ability to do something, but he didn't do something? When you're frustrated, I want you to know running and drawing near to God, even when, it, when you don't understand about what's going on, is the best thing you can do for you and for others. That perspective of saying, God, I don't get it. We just spoke about this a few weeks ago. What do I do when I don't understand? We still run to God. Because His plans are perfect for you. His plans and His purposes are perfect for you. What do you do when you don't understand? Why are things happening to me? Why is it so hard? What do I do? I run to God. I go, I, I go to God. It's the safest and the best place that you can do. Um, what do you do uh, if it feels like your whole world is over? Like everything's just done. Like if we take Peter... And, and John and the other disciples, what did Peter say after Jesus died and, he, and he's buried? And, uh, you know, what did Peter do? He went back fishing. He said, no, I'm done with this. I'm going to go fishing again. So it felt like everything that I was following, everything that I was doing, the things that I was pursuing has just died. There's no more hope for it. What does Peter do? He goes back to his old ways. That, that, remember, they had a business, Peter and Andrew. Dad had a business, fishing business. L listen to this, I love this. And he said to them, cast, and this is Jesus walking on the, sea, on the shore. He sees Peter and Andrew and John back in the boat with their father, um, doing fishing. And Jesus walking along the shore, and he said this to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast. And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, <laughs> that disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea, which is the weirdest thing to me. <laughs> what would we do if somebody is calling us on the side and you're wearing a big garment? Take it off. And, and then book it. Peter puts on the jacket and dives into the water. We'll talk about that soon. But the disciple, but the disciple, um, the other disciple came in the little boat. Who's the other disciple? John, the one whom Jesus loved. For they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire and coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land. So now Simon Peter's finally arrived on the shore. He's got his jacket on. The other disciple just went with the boat. <laughs> right? Got there before him, brought the fish with him. Simon Peter comes. He drags the fish to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him who you are, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. What did John do and what did Peter do after it felt like their lives were over? He didn't only run to Jesus. He put on his old self. He jumped into the water and he swam to him just to get to him. If you think your world is over, this is the time to draw near to God. This is the time to do it. Number two. What do we do um, to figure out what our ministry is? So number one is we have to draw near to God. Number two, we have to discover and develop our gifts. You have to discover what your gifts are. And then, not just to discover them for the purpose of, huh, we have to discover them and develop them. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4, For in fact the body is not one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body was Pastor Andreas, it would be ridiculous. If the body of churches were just about the pastors, we would be useless. You don't want more than one of me. 
To which Carla would probably say, Amen. <laughs> you know, we don't want more, but I want one of you functioning in your purpose. I want you in the roles that God has created you to be in. But how we do it? We have to discover what God has created us to be. We have to figure out, God, what role do you have for me? Um, and this is very interesting also. It says in verse 22, In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. To which I would say, pastors, evangelists, preachers, teachers are not the least. Oh, actually are the least. The ones that are not visible are the most. The ones that we can't see I really believe in our body. It's not being on a platform that puts you in ministry. It's being in ministry wherever you go that, that really is of value. Not every single one of you should desire to preach or teach or be on a platform because it's the ones that we can see that is of value. And if you look, look at this picture of this boat, um, I want to ask you, the wood that you see there, right? So, so this is a wooden boat. Which wood do you think is the most important? The little piece right here? Is that an important part of, of it? If we remove that, will the boat still float? Yes. If I remove this bottom part of wood, which we can't see, what will happen to it? It will sink. Right now, we have in children's ministry people that you don't even see. They are doing more important work than me just preaching on a Sunday morning. Right now, in Sunday mornings, when you get here, we've had people that's already praying for the service, that's already interceding on your behalf. By the time you get here, we have people that's put flags out, that's made coffee, that gets everything ready so that we are able to receive God's Word. Without those people ministering, in their areas of their gifting. And, and, and it's, not just, um, it's not just about being able to pray for people and seeing signs, wonders, and miracles happen. It's ministering in your gifting, something that you've discovered you are good at, and God can use it. These people are doing it. I want to thank um, those guys, the people that have signed up. I want to thank those who've signed up already. But our children's ministry, um, uh, we ask for more people to step up and help us because we've got such a plan to get our kids to know God that we needed more people to help us. We've had nine more people sign up, which is phenomenal. To every single one of you, thank you. Now, I know not every one of us are called to sign up for children's ministry, but there are so many other areas where you can serve in the church, but there are so many other areas where you can serve outside of the church, at your workplace, on the ball field, at the hockey rink, at your school, at your office, wherever you are, God is calling you to be somebody who's going to make a difference in people's lives. Because we together know 90,000 people, I can influence 150. You are the ones that influences them. This is the bottom part of the boat which we can't see. That is what makes the kingdom of God grow. As you understanding that you've got a purpose. But you have to discover and you have to develop your gift. Romans 12 verse 4 says the following. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We have gifts that is different inside of every... We've got twins. We've, well, we've got one of them. Um, the other one is... Seven. We, we have twins. There's maybe more than one. We've got triplets. Where's Marco? He's here also. We've got triplets and twins um, in our church. Do you know that even though they are twins, they don't have the same ministry gifts? They've been given different gifts. Don't feel guilty if your brother and sister is doing something, and I think that's what I need to do also. Discover your gift and be good at it. Make a difference in people's lives with your gift. If you are not, I want to say, uh, and this is not to, to bring anybody down or to, or to bring guilt or condemnation or, or anything, but, but if you are not currently functioning and ministering within a gift, you are missing out on what God wants you to do. You, you are not functioning 
appropriately. You are becoming something that's going to just um, receive from God, receive from God, and eventually you're going to be, be um, just so, so over that you almost become useless to Him because it's just about you. He does not want us to be, be overweight Christians, if I can put it that way. He wants to constantly feed us so that we can constantly give out. That's what He wants. He wants us to be givers. Um, so each one of us have different gifts given to us according to His Christ. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, who he exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty. Thank you. Liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who sows in mercy with cheerfulness. Let us do that. Let us discover our gifts and let us develop them. Now, here's a picture which I'm sure all of you know what that is. Christmas, right? And, and, and what I've discovered, and I'm, I'm sure that you've discovered this also, one of the most exciting things over Christmas is having kids open up gifts. Love it. Love having the kids, and I try to drag it out as long as I possibly can. <laughs> right? I use my time in between every gift. Right? They can't just, they can't just dig in. Like, I play it. I love it. So, so what I've discovered is in opening a gift is, do you know what's inside of it? Unless you're Ermery and you peek every year. <laughs> but do you know what is inside your gift? No. So what's the first step of receiving a gift? It's discovering what it is. So what do I do when I receive a gift? Listen, God, it's like Oprah. You get a gift. You get a gift. Everybody gets a gift. You've all been given gifts. Yeah. Oprah wishes she can gift like God gifts. Yeah. God's given every single one of you gifts. But do you understand? Some of you are going to show up in heaven, and you're going to have a whole pile of gifts that were meant for here. Yeah. Unopened up there. There's so many gifts that we haven't, we haven't even stepped into it. And why? Because if we have the mindset that church is just about me, you will not have the desire to discover what gifts have God has given me to influence other people's lives. If, if the church remains in the mindset that church is about me, feeding me, getting me to be better, get, if we think that, yes, those things will happen, but it is for the purpose so that I can be effective outside of this building, outside of Sundays, to influence other people's lives. Therefore, I desire your gifts because I want to change their lives. If our mindsets remain me, 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 this body inside, close little circle, VIP club. That's why we have people in churches without gifts. Because there's no use for them. Pastor's doing it. Staff is doing it. Worship leaders are doing it. You know, we don't, I don't need to minister. They, they've got enough people that can do it. That's why we get pew warmers. Right? They just nice warm it up for the next session that comes in. If we don't have the heart and the mindset that I am gifted for the purpose to give, you will not desire to open up your gifts. And there's, the only people who can change that heart's desire is you. Only person who can understand, listen, God loves me so that I can love other people is you. I cannot, I cannot convince you to do that. But I know the Holy Spirit can. And I know that's His heart for our community. And I'm going to continue to preach it every Sunday. I'm going to continue to preach it every week. That God wants us to use our gifts for other people. So now my kids open up the gifts. And what many people do, um, and, I mean, and I won't name names, but like David Anderson, that opens up a drone... And just takes it out and flies it and loses it on the first time he takes it out on his first flight because he didn't realize that the drone doesn't come back when the battery's flat. <laughs> so somewhere over to Watson, somebody found a new drone. But what do we do? We discover our gifts. Open it up. Now I'm discovering how to use it. <laughs> I'm discovering how to use this thing. I don't know if you know this. Most people who open up a gift 
aren't experts at it. Most of the time, they're opening it up for the first time, something that they've never discovered before. Now, I have to learn how to use and develop this gift that God has given me. And there are parameters, and there's, there's ways to do it. And do you know what else there is? There's incredible instructions. With every gift, there's incredible instructions. It's either on the side of the box, or it's inside on the manual. And if you're like me, and you're a guy, and you get a gift, what do you do right after you get it? Take the manual, go to the toilet. <laughs> and then you read it. And then you come back, and then you use it as if you're an expert, and you've done it many times. Right? That's what we do. Kenny? <laughs> exactly. He doesn't read the instructions. Do you know how many of us haven't read the instructions on how to use God's gifts? I think many times that's why there's been damage in churches, because it's not that it's not God wanting to minister to us, but we haven't read the instruction manual on how to use His gifts. It's in here. There's an instruction manual on how to love people. And I, again, I think um, it is, it's one of the mistakes which the church has to repent from. I'm not saying, so, saying sorry for. Change our thinking in. Is that the gift is not for me. Yes, I'm going to have pleasure in using this gift, this ministry. I'm going to enjoy ministering in my gift. But it's not just for my enjoyment. It is for the purpose of loving other people. Therefore, when I give my kids on Christmas um, a, a new skateboard, there are some, some rules and guidelines that I, I kind of give instruction with the skateboard. For an example, you have to wear a helmet. Why? Because you can get hurt. And you can't go and do it in the street. Why? Because you can get hurt. If I give my teenager a new car... Um, I'm going to say to him, listen, we're going to drive in certain places. And there's some instruction. There's some teaching that's involved with driving this car. Why? Because they can get hurt. But not just them. Who else? Others can get hurt. So, and that's happened. We've seen people discover their gifts. And then they just go out. That, that was a machine gun. That was a water balloon. I just tried it. <laughs> and we've seen that happen in church. And what's happened is we've seen people put off by church. We've seen people put off by Christians. And Christians, good intentions. I want to see people saved. Not being sensitive to, and God is sensitive. I want you to know that. God, is, God, God knows every single person. He knows where every single person is at. He knows how they are supposed to be reached. He knows how your gift is supposed to reach them. He knows exactly what he is doing. He made that person, and he knows how your ministry is going to influence that person to accept the love that he has for them. But what we do is we think, I've ridden a skateboard before. It's all the same thing every time. No, God has instruction for every single time you minister. There is something that He wants you to know about the person you are ministering to. It is not just a blanket. Let's paint them all the same color. They're receiving a gift. I've got a gift. I'm going to train myself in this gift. We want to train you in gift. I'm excited because, Mark, we don't have a name, name for it yet. But after Stephen's... Um, course that we're doing, Hearing God's Voice. We have 55 people signed up for it so far. Fantastic. If you haven't signed up yet, sign up. It's good for you. Hear God's voice. Why? Because I want to hear God's plans and purposes for my life so I can change other people's lives. I want that. After that, we're going to have a month break, and then we're coming back with discovering your identity. Why? In my identity, I will discover my gifts I will discover my ministry and my purpose. And I'm going to learn how to use God's gifts to influence other people's lives, not just for my benefit. So in discovering a gift, discovering your gifts is opening it up. God, you've gifted me to be a teacher. Okay, you've gifted me to be, now I have to develop this gift. I have to learn also as teachers. Sometimes, um, you know, Chip Brim, after he was uh, with us the, the Sunday morning service, he came over for dinner this evening. 
And, and in my mind, I just wanted to have a relaxed evening <laughs> with him, which I think if you've seen Chip, like, he started talking a few times, and then he would say, wait, I have to stand up to do this. So, and then he goes back into teaching mode. And I'm like, dude, I don't want a teaching moment right now. I just want to relax. We have to learn when to be teachers and when to relax. We have to learn when to, around our family, just to love them and not beat them with the Bible. We have to learn when is the right time to speak hope. I'm, I'm constantly, uh, I'm playing slow pitch this weekend again. It's our last weekend. I'm playing in the men's league. Rough. Um, like there's some um, rough oysters out there. Um, and, you know, there's language and everything else. And, you know, there's so much going on. And, and I'm constantly, every moment I'm around them, I'm asking God, I know you've called me to minister to them. Let me be effective. What do I say? How do I love them? How do I encourage them? Which one do you want me to say what to? It is discovering in the moments. Once you recognize you've been given a gift to teach, to encourage, to uplift, to help other people, in those moments, I'm constantly in conversation with them. Even though there's F-bombs flying all around me. Even though there's, there's cursing and, and everything else that you can think of happening around me. In those moments, I'm saying, God, you've given me this gift. I've unwrapped them. I know I am equipped. I've got them on my belt. I don't go out and slap people with a tennis racket and with a uh, you know, cricket bat and everything else that I've got around me. Because it's ineffective. We want to be people. 90,000 people we can reach. 90, and I, I know we can. If we do take those gifts and we unwrap and we open them up and we say, okay, God, we equipped. We're going to become those people that's going to minister. I'm going to be one of those that's at the bottom of the boat. I don't have to be on church on, on, on the platform on Sunday morning. I don't have to be on the worship team to prove that I'm a worshiper. I don't have to do those things. You've called me for a purpose and for a ministry, and I want to do that. Amen? Amen? We have to discover our gifts, develop our gifts, develop our, our skills. Um, know where to use them for the first time. Know how to use them effectively. This is a safe place to use your gifts. I do not send Lene out with a new rollerblades on Highway 1. <laughs> I do not. I actually send her out on the carpet first where they don't really move. No, no, it's, you know... Um, it's like, uh, maybe by the, I don't think it will happen in this church, but, I, but it could. Like somebody send me an email. You know what, Andreas? I read the Bible this week. Got a scripture. I'm ready to preach on Sunday. Do you know how much the growth and development God wants to put in us? Not saying that you can do it. Not saying that God hasn't gifted you in that. But we need to know that, that we, I will not expose you to harming yourself or others. It's part of being leaders in church is guarding you in your ministry. Not keeping you from it, but guarding you, helping you, developing you, helping you to grow so that you can become effective and mature and influence other people. I don't want to, we've been in churches. I'm sure all of you have been in churches where you've seen where there's no guardrails. And it's a free for all. And people leave the church because they're saying there's, there's, it's too whack. I don't want that. My heart, if you ever feel in our church that we're holding you back, our heart is not to hold anybody back. Our heart is for people to grow in their gifts. And as they grow, you will be recognized and your gift will make more opportunities for you to minister within the church. Safe place so that we can be effective outside. So we are going to do three things. The third thing is the following, and, and it's the th last one is really short. Number one, we're going to draw close to God. Number two, we're going to discover and develop our gifts. And number three, do something. Do something. Now, isn't it interesting that these three really line up with last week's message also? I just gave them different words, which made it really easy for me to prepare this week because it's really the same message, just with a different heading. 
but, but here are the three lines. Number one, draw near to God. Know God. You have to know God. You want to discover what God's got planned for you? Draw near to God. Number two, discover and develop your gifts. We have to grow in them. We are not just called to come to church on Sunday. That is not the church that we are. It's not the church that we will be. I will challenge you. I will continue to challenge you. If I see that week after week you hear fantastic, fantastic, you are growing. But I'm going to challenge you. Where is God calling you to minister? And what are you doing about it? And number three, do something. Start glowing for God. Start reflecting the light that you are receiving. Become that reflection to people on the outside. Because I want to save. I want to save people. Elisha. How many of you know what Elisha did before he became um, the double anointing prophet? How many of you know what Elisha did? Anybody? Yeah. It's, it's a hard one. Let's read. 2 Kings 3. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know what his, his job was? So prophets weren't allowed to, to touch dirty things, weren't allowed to, to be in contact with dead animals, or, or they weren't allowed to, to, to touch a cup which might have been touched by somebody who hasn't been cleansed or purified. So Elisha's job was pouring water. It seems small, but he became the prophet that was, had double the anointing of the one whose hands he was washing. Paul, what did Paul do first after he got saved? He, his name hasn't changed yet, but, but you'll see. And in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they did, this they also did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. This is after Saul met Jesus, went away for a few years, came back, presented himself to the disciples, said, I no longer want to kill the, the Jewish people um, or Christians. I actually, I want to lead people to Christ now. And this is Saul, your first job, the first job we're giving you as a, as, as a church. We're sending you out as a messenger boy, but not, not a messenger. You're going to work for UPS. You are going to deliver money. So uh, trash, uh, cash and transit. What's, what's those big cars? Armored cars. That, whatever that is. So his job was to take money from the church to other churches. Before his name changed. His first job wasn't, okay, Saul, you've had an incredible encounter with God. We're just going to promote you. You're going to stand in front of everybody. Yeah, uh, you're going to write two-thirds of or a third of the New Testament. Fantastic. No, no, Saul, you know what you're going to do first? We're going to have you deliver money from the one point to the next, which I find very interesting. If you can't handle God's money, you can't handle God's ministry. So, so Paul was a deliverer. Elisha washed hands. David was a shepherd. Jesus was a carpenter. You might be a businessman. You might be a teacher. You might be a, a framer, electrician, a plumber, a salesman, a tourism expert, but not like Rahab was with the, all the extras. Whatever it you might be in, God wants to use you. And it all comes down to that first scripture that I said. If you draw near to God... He will draw near to you. And as you draw near to God, you'll get to recognize His heart. And His heart becomes your heart. And as His heart becomes your heart, your heart will start feeling for other people. And then it will no longer just be about you and about your church and about, you know, your ministry. It will be about people. My definition for drawing near to God is the following. Spend time. 
you have to spend time with God. You. You, 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 you. You have to spend time with Him. If you're struggling today, you have to spend time with Him. If you've struggled for the last five years, you have to spend time with Him. If you've been in an addiction, if you are in addiction, you have to spend time with Him. If you've given up on life, you have to spend time with Him. If you are in church and you've been here for 40 years, you have to spend time with Him. Every single one of you, we have to spend time with Him. Not as a couple, not as a home group, not as friends. You. You. And not just once. This should become something that you do every single day because that's where life comes from. And that's where we get to know His heart. God's got a ministry for you. We're going to reach 90,000 people. We are going to reach 90,000 people. And more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, you desire us. Your desire is for your people that you've created. You desire your sons and your daughters, everybody that don't even know you yet. You've died for them also, but you desire every single one of them to get to know you. To get to know that you love us. That you've got a plan and a purpose for us to love us. And I pray, Lord, that every person in this room will become someone that's going to influence other people's lives to get to know you. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will, from this day forward, constantly remind us that we are called into ministering your word. That our words matter. That our conduct matter. That our actions matter. That the things that we say to the people around us, it all matters. Because it's all ministering. And God, I can either minister on your behalf to people around me, or I can minister on the enemy's behalf to the people around me. I choose you. I choose my life to reflect you. I choose my actions to reflect you. My words, my thoughts, my language, everything to reflect you. I want to minister for you, Lord. Make me an agent of your kingdom. Now, I do want to ask this morning, if you've been away from God, let's say maybe you've committed your life way uh, long ago or maybe recently, but but it just feels like you've been away from God. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to say, God, Um, I just want to make a commitment to you again and say that I want to be somebody who's going to minister for you. I want my life to minister for you, Lord. If that's you this morning with everybody's eyes closed and heads bowed, I just want you to raise your hand and say, God, I want to change my life. I want to minister for you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. That's great. That's amazing. Awesome. It doesn't mean simply because you raised your hand, things are going to go easy. It means that you're going to have to make decisions, change patterns, do things so that you can spend time with God because that's where ministering to God flows from. You have to make those efforts. Now, for anybody here this morning, I want to encourage you this morning.